In the development of any game, it's always a good idea to make a prototype first. This way, if anything needs to be changed later on, you don't have to throw away many hours of work. But that doesn't mean you have to use just colored shapes, and there are ways to make it a little less boring. Here's how I made my current indie game project a little more interesting, and how by doing so it actually improved my game development overall. But first, let me explain the concept of the game I'm working on. Void Titans are massive terraforming machines with AI that got out of control. And with the ability to portal themselves around the infinite world known as the Void, they are hard to keep track of. A Void Titan consumes all matter in front of them, turning the matter they take in into more Void Titans. The only thing keeping them in check is the Void Watch, an organization that protects the infinite world and its people. You play as Yarek Varone, an elite soldier known as a Titan Guard, with special training and equipment similar to the Void Titan technology just on a much smaller scale. Because the Void Watch is spread so thin, only one Titan Guard can be sent at a time to handle a Void Titan when it's detected. And this is where you come in. It'll be your job to gather different kinds of matter that can help you create what you need to stay ahead of the Void Titan and eventually stop it. Each kind of matter will be harder to collect than the last, building up to a device that can stop a Void Titan completely. I came up with this idea while thinking about side-scroller games and thought, why do we always run to the right? And what if I were to make a game where the whole point is you really can't run to the left? Perhaps there could be something destroying the world behind you as you go. The thought process continued and because I needed some sort of win condition, I figured the player's goal would be to stop whatever it is that is eating the world behind you. It seemed like a fun idea, so I started on prototyping. A lot of the time when we think of prototyping, at least for me, I think of really basic squares and shapes, and that's what I've done a lot in the past. I started this project with that in mind. The first thing I did was create a procedural terrain generation. Because the player is always moving to the right, I only needed to generate terrain in one direction, so I came up with a system that would loop through a height value, placing in one block at a time until reaching the height value, then moving one block to the right, and repeating. The height value would randomly change up or down, and with some guidance from a few other functions, it would randomize the slopes in a more natural way. It wasn't hard to add in stone spawning several blocks below the height value, and even easier to spawn in other blocks that might be in the game. The issue was all my blocks looked really stupid. So by reminding myself that whatever I made would probably be changed later on, I kind of freed my mind. And I was able to quickly throw together some slightly more interesting textures. This took a little to no effort, and I'm not going to feel bad when I change it later. It gives the prototype a closer feel to what the final game might be. And who knows, I might actually even keep these sprites. Either way, it made deciding on actual game content a little bit easier, so it's totally worth it even if I don't keep them. Creating the player character Yarik was also pretty easy to make more interesting than the blue rectangle that I had. I looked up some inspiration, then quickly drew something that looked alright. Then for each of the animation frames, I just used simple colors without detailing. And in no time at all, I had a prototype character that made the game feel a lot more real. And to make animating him easier, I decided to put the matter converting tech on his back. That way I wouldn't have to worry about figuring out animating his arm position while he's running or jumping. So prototyping him this way immediately helped with actual development choices. The prototype of the actual Void Titan was also easy because it's just a big wall that moves across the screen. And you see it infrequently enough that I didn't spend a lot of time on it. And it is probably wise to spend less time on things you see less often. But later on, I will put many hours into the look and feel of the Void Titan. Let me know what you imagine it looks like, as I still haven't pinned that down yet. Now I've already been self-playtesting the prototype extensively, and it's a lot easier to grasp how the game feels, and what direction I may need to go in. For example, I found a round can be played in about 15 to 25 minutes, so while trying to avoid scope creep, I recognize the game will need certain elements to invite repeated sessions. I plan on creating a hub or home where the player can hang out between missions. Here you can spend your mission payments to create and customize your living space. Fancier decorations or building material will cost more, but just like in the missions, you can convert anything in your living space into matter and build something new. And if I had a few different game modes or map difficulties, a player could challenge themselves for a chance at greater rewards. Now I might not have seen the need for this so soon if I wasn't able to accurately envision how the end game would be through a more detailed prototype. One other tip for prototyping came with my biggest challenge I've run into so far, which is lag. It is very taxing to generate terrain as quickly as the player moves forward, as well as storing everything between the player and the Void Titan in case the player needs to backtrack. But I called up my friend Robot, and he helped me come up with a few quick lag-reducing fixes to make the game playable. 
Some of these fixes include turning off visibility of any blocks not close to the player, storing the blocks in chunks to make them easier to delete, less taxing ways to store and decide on random textures for blocks, and the obvious solution of reducing the overall world height. I want this game to be playable on even budget computers, so reducing lag will be an ongoing task. But because I don't want to burn myself out during the prototyping stage, I use these smaller fixes to make the game playable for now. When prototyping, it is better to get something done quickly than to spend hours and hours optimizing and fixing unless absolutely necessary. Then later on, you can come back and improve performance. This is what prototyping is all about. No, you can change and improve anything later on, but get enough playable with enough details is key in quickly understanding the feel your game might have. Plus with these added features, I'm sure even this video was a bit more fun to look at and understand, and it will be helpful for pitching and marketing, which is great because this is going to be my first commercial game. I've never made a game to actually sell before, by the way, and so because you are hopefully better are able to understand what the finished product will be, I would love to hear what you think I should value it at. I would love to hear your ideas as I'm sure you have some good ones. What do you think I may need to add or subtract to make the game marketable and worthwhile? Due to a better prototyping method, I'm really excited to be working on this game, and I feel like I'm a little better off than I would be, and I can't wait to hear what you think. Thanks for watching, and have a beautiful day.